Hi, this is Malika of Evanston Live TV, and I have with me today a very special woman, a woman that I've gotten to know over the past so few years. <laughs> <laughs> She's running for 7th Ward Alderman. This is Mary Rosensky. Welcome back. You've been a guest on the show before. Yes, thank you so much, Malika. You cover everything in Evanston, so I'm honored to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your time. I know this is such a busy time for you right now. First of all, before you were running, the, the time period that I've known you, you have always been a woman like on the go. You're showing up at, uh, at all sorts of city events, uh, city discussions. And I just want people to know you are about the research. And yeah. How does she hold all this information in her? You have the numbers, the, the statistics, you have everything laid out for your argument because you're always fighting for the people of Evanston. And I think that's what people absolutely love about you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I do like numbers. I like facts. Um, I like to, I just like to know what really happened. And since I've moved to Evanston like 30 years ago, that was my first encounter with getting actively involved in Evanston um, change. And so since uh, over the years, I've always been involved with anything that I thought would help make our community even better. So from that, you build this institutional knowledge uh, and history of things. And for some reason, that just sticks in my mind. Uh, I don't know why, but people can say something. I'll be like, oh yeah, I remember back then. <laughs> But that's kind of how I like it. I like people to know what they're making their decisions on too and what the precedent was. And I actually like to have guidelines. I like rules that everyone understands. And I like policies that are based on the values that we said we were going to do. So that's kind of how I kept getting involved in Evanston politics. Um, I know one of the things that you were you were, I mean, you were a fireball on was the, the Robert Crown situation. And I mean, you, Claire Kelly, Mike Veselko, you all had your facts laid out, laid out. And um, even though Robert Crown was already in the midst of construction and, and moving forward, um, why don't you explain to the people exactly what you were trying to accomplish? You were trying to educate everyone on what was happening. And I don't think majority of Evanston was awake at that time, but you were. No, and the reason that that became so important to us was that project when it first started being talked about about 10 years ago was going to be somewhere from three to ten million dollars and then it got up to 20 million dollars and we were working on lots of other local issues so i sort of thought you know that seems appropriate for a recreation community center and they seem to have it a plan on it and so i didn't really pay attention for about a year or two years and then it started escalating and then the numbers started not making sense so back around 2018 is when Mike, Claire, Darlene, and some of the others started looking at these numbers and the city had just gone through another one of its budget crises that year and they were cutting back on services and yet we were projecting forward on a bill that would hit the taxpayers to somewhere between two and a half to $3 million a year. And everyone I talked to didn't seem to know what was going on. So we started delving into how this happened. I mean, we have we went all the way back to 2011 and pulled up every record that we could find. And then a lot of stuff wasn't available. So then we started doing FOIAs on the project. And what it came down to where we, we, you really saw us start surfacing was in 2019 when we, we hadn't, the city council had not yet moved forward on financing the bonds. And what we were saying was, you had, you're not even done with your design. So if you're not done with your design and you're already over 42 million, the public doesn't know about this. Let's stop this for right now. Let's get people up to grade because simultaneously, like 
in other communities like Glenview had was redoing their ice rinks. And when they got past 25 million, they told the decision makers to go back and pull $2 million off the amount that they had told the public they were gonna do because it had gotten up to 27 million. So I think the more we found out about it and then the relationship of how this was being funded and who was being, who was being um, raising money didn't make sense. And not, nothing really made sense, but the city council continued to move forward with this. So first of all, they borrowed like $40 million and then we kept trying saying, don't go for the next 20 million until, or 18 million, whatever it was, until you know where you're going with this, but they just moved forward with it. So that's why it was important because they're, you know, we're gonna be paying on that project with the operating costs, probably close to $4 million a year. Mm -hmm. And then other inequities of that whole project came to light, like the fact that the Friends of Crown had negotiated with Beacon Academy that the prime basketball time was going to be for the private school. And we were saying our kids should have the prime time after school during the winter that they can go play basketball and they can go play volleyball. So that caused a lot of, you know, dis discourse in the city. And then I think people started going, well, who's making these deals with a public rink at our public facilities? And so that's where we ended up. The city council moved forward on it anyway, but they could have stopped back in 20, at the beginning of 2019 and revisited the project and probably done something. And I think the important thing to know on that entire project, which is one of the things I'm running on, is I'm running on stop spending money we don't have on projects we don't need or that are mismanaged. And in that particular project, one contractor was given the contract and it was $10 million more than the next contractor who was incredibly well-versed in the construction of other projects in Evanston and ice rinks. And that cost us almost $700,000 a year just for that one person. And the reason they got it was they were supposed to meet the Black Minority Women Initiative, which is like 25% of your people there will be you know, a minority group and they didn't meet it. So all they got fined was $500,000. So I feel like our city got, you know, hooked for $9.5 million on something that was supposed to be met that didn't get met. So that's a lot of money. That's a big mismanagement. Yes, that was a lot of money. And I, I thank you for educating me, informing me on all of that that was going on. Yeah, well, thanks for hosting us on that because no one would listen. We were at city council like every other week talking about this and we just it was like falling on deaf ears and people were like it's done it's out of the project you know there's nothing you can do and i'm like okay so now we're at the point where people are saying there's nothing you can do but we can do something we can find a way to repurpose and make that place make more money so that we don't lose so much money each year on it and some people think i was against recreation centers in the fourth ward whatever and that's never was the issue the issue was if you have money, you need to spend it wisely. Right. So for example, I, I was the one, because I'm in real estate, who looked at what other hockey rinks and recreation centers were being built around the country within a couple year period and how much they cost. And I turned over the prospectus to every one of the city council members. And there was a place out in Utah that had done a detailed perspective on it. And we were twice as much per square foot as the most expensive one there. I think the most expensive one they had was $212 a square foot and we're at about $414 a square foot. Mm -hmm. So it just all these things, all we wanted them to do was stop. But now we can look at it and go, if we don't need the hockey rinks, how much does it cost to get, you know, reconfigure it so that basketball, volleyball courts can go over the ice rinks like they do down at the bowls. I mean, that costs more money, but if you can make your rinks work for you, you know, every day of the year, that's good. So during when it's not hockey season, those two rinks can be used for something else or one rink at least. And we just have to figure out how to make it make more sense financially. Right. 
so at what point did you say, you know what, I'm tired of being the person uh, <laughs> a comment behind the podium trying to tell them stop spending money that, that we don't have to now you're like, I need to be up there on that diet. Well, you know, that's a really good question. A lot of people are like, why now? You know, after 30, I always wanted to just work from the outside. I had I had no aspirations to be an older person because I really felt you elect all the people to work for you. But then we law in one year, they gave Northwestern University commercial use zoning in their nonprofit area. And they have 242 acres of tax exempt land. And zoning is worth a lot. And we got nothing in return for it at all. Not that I would have voted for it anyway, but to just give a nonprofit the commercial use is ridiculous. So that was the first thing, because that was, you know, 30 years ago, we've had to fight this battle like every seven years with Northwestern. They've wanted commercial zoning in their nonprofit area for as long as I've been here. So we lost that. And then we lost our libraries. And then the city manager process came up and the city manager process was where the, all the residents had been promised a voice and that they would listen, that the city would listen to what we felt as residents was necessary in our city government um, and who the city manager is since they are not an elected person. And then somewhere in the middle of it, the mayor suggested that they just hire the interim um, city manager and uh, you know our alderman agreed that she would vote for her and if this is not a discussion on whether or not Erica is a good or not good city manager this is a point of I've always liked transparent process and they just were going to shut the door on it but thank God for a couple of the other aldermen who said no you know we promised the residents that they would have input on this and we will do it uh, so that it was those three things in a row that just went like, I, I don't know what's going on on the dais behind the scenes, but I know that we need to have a better discussion. And then they, the other thing they did was they, you know, got a list of things that maybe the city should sell as an asset. And now I'm in real estate, now I'm putting on my real estate hat. And our real estate assets are really valuable. And I got concerned when I looked at that list and how much they were asking for it as to, once again, are we making a bad decision if we sell some of these things? For example, you know, the Civic Center, 80% of the people years ago said, don't sell it, fix it, keep it as the Civic Center. And yet the council is like putting it on the block as maybe. They said, you know, we had another referendum two years ago, not 2018 do not sell the Harley Clark mansion. And the council was pretty non-responsive with the exception of like our older person and Tom suffered in and, um, but they would have sold it in a second and privatized it. And I believe wholeheartedly that our public places, our lakefront, that's what brings residents to Evanston. So if you wanna bring your taxpayers to live here and have a great community, you need to keep your public spaces. And you need to protect your, your lakefront. That's our most valuable asset. So I started thinking, whatever's going on behind the scenes on the dais and in the executive sessions, they're not getting the perspective of a person who has been bringing people into our community, who works with all the other communities on the North Shore and sees how they're doing. I mean, what we get for our dollar is not nearly as much as some of the other communities when I look at how much parks cost, how much this cost. And I think we need that perspective. So that was where the four things that just said, okay, I'm tired of spending all my Mondays at Civic, Civic Center talking on that side when no one's listening on this side. And then I just saw them start, you know, some of the older people were so disrespectful and of the people. And they were calling the people uncivil yet the people they called us a circus. I said, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> people don't come to civic, you know, people come because they feel that they're not being heard. And it takes a lot. So for every one person that shows up that can make the time to come up or sacrifice, you know, other things. I got tired of saying, you know, one of the, the 
city official said, you know, the only reason all you guys show up at council is because you have nothing else to do. Huh. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. We're paying your salary. And you say that about the residents who like are sacrificing. They could be home. They could be with their family. They could be doing this or that. And I think that was probably the final nail that said, this is nonsense. Because I have five kids. I work full time. I'd much rather be doing hobbies and visiting with my family. And I'd like to feel that I could trust what's going on there, that they are really making decisions that will make my life in Evanston as easy as possible. So, yeah. I, so that was where kind of the reasons. Well, I am in your ward. I'm in the seventh ward. Oh, well, that's right. I forgot. I live in the well, so you know all the battles. People think we don't have battles. We have battles all the time. <laughs> and we try to work with it. But like when they were going to narrow down Green Bay Road to one street, one lane. Mm -hmm. I'm like, if you're driving around the ward all the time, if you're here, we have three shifts of hospital traffic down up and down Green Bay every day of the year. And so if you, and then we have the Metro getting out at Central Street. And some planner came up with the idea of narrowing it down to one lane on going each direction. And it was like, you've got to be crazy. I mean, I don't know. You're going to be backed up to Winnetka. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what are some of your plans for uh, the seventh ward? I mean, I think our ward, I mean, I love Evanston. It's one of the best places. I've lived other absolutely. places in the country, and I absolutely love Evanston, and I love the seventh ward. I love being able to walk out my door and walk up Central Street, get me some coffee, shop at the boutiques and, you know, God willing, they all stay open. I know there's been a couple that's, you know, because of COVID-19, but to me, that is just the life in Evanston, absolute life in Evanston. So what, what are your visions? What are your plans for our ward? Oh, that's a good question. So I think, first of all, if I am lucky enough to become an older person, I would like to start having weekly Zoom hour meetings where I'm just here so anyone who wants to come can join and tell me how they're thinking what's going on in their community. Um, I think communication is really critical that way. And I think monthly ward meetings, town hall type meetings are really important. So that would be the first thing. Um, I think with Northwestern being as one of, Northwestern's a great asset on many levels. But it also is a huge, huge facility that is always pushing its boundaries onto the neighborhoods. And there's this balance that needs to happen between the taxpaying residents who have set up their families and are really looking forward to having a, their life here and Northwestern pushing out against that. So we have to maintain that balance. So to that level, I, my first, one of the first things I'd like to do is set up meetings and discussion with Northwestern and create with the council in Northwestern a program that we can get pilots, which are payments in lieu of taxes. Because I think that the city needs Northwestern to be a better fair share partner. And so that would be the first thing. Um, the second thing would be to be working with the business district, because I think our business district is what brings people here too. The, everybody loves convenience. You know, if you can, like you say, you, you're working all day, it's nice to be able to walk out. So I think, you know, working with them to, and the Economic Development Committee to figure out what are ways we can help them be more successful and stay in business. Because these are the, they're the greatest little stores. Um, the other thing I think is really important is we need to protect our lakefront. I get worried that we, you know, for 10 years I've been fighting privatization of our lakefront at Harley Clark and Lake Lighthouse Landing. I'd like that issue settled. I'd like the city to listen to, there's four great proposals for public use. And I think as a council, we need to stop going against what the public says and say, and endorse them. Our residents in Evanston are amazingly creative and innovative and willing to roll up their sleeves, like no place else I've ever seen. And 
and you know, and there's a lot of different opinions, but we can make something. Like when we were fighting for the libraries, it, we kept the library open an extra 10 years, the branch libraries and the city council at that time had wanted to close them. And we rallied together with the businesses and kept coming out in front and saying, for every person, who comes to the library, for every dollar rather you invest in your library, you get about six other dollars. And this is not from us making this up. This is from general national statistics, but because they come to the library and then they go to the Starbucks and the food store, and then they go here and here. So there's, libraries are actually generators, economic generators. And I think we have to look at our public assets as potential economic generators. And for some reason, we could never get that idea across to the city and the library board. And, um, and I think too, with the Harley Clark, I think that it can be a public space. Well, let me go back to the library a second. So they were gonna close it. And then we proposed that, what if we raise some money to keep it running, this and the South Branch? Um, and they said, well, yeah, good luck. You'll never do that. But the people in Evanston, we came together, we raised almost $200,000 in six months. And to me, if I were on console, I would be saying, how the heck did that group do it? And wow, the public wants this stuff. And so I think there's sort of a disconnect between the public and the city council when it comes to decisions or what people can do. Because you know, people are, have our busy lives. They can't all get in their car. We're supposed, we're supposed to be a walkable society, right? Get in their car, drive downtown, get a parking ticket, and then, you know, come back home with their kids if they're working. And so I think looking at those little conveniences in some way or another and going to the Harley Clark, I say, you know, work with the people who are out there that are going to raise some money to make that a place for the public. So that, you know, there's, there's the you know, ecological uh, proposal, there's the arts proposal. There's a lot of great proposals out there and it's gonna take time, but you're gonna have to have faith. And, if the, and I guess that's part of it. If the city didn't have some sort of hidden agendas, then what they could have, all they had to do with the Harley Clark was get behind it. Those people, there's hundreds and hundreds of people who didn't ask for anything from the city. And they could have just said, we support that idea. Let's give you four years. Let's give you to do it. But they didn't. They fight them every sense of the way. And I feel sometimes you need to support your innovative people and say, let's do it. Let's be the collaborative Evanston that we say we are. Um, I love that about you, Mary. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. you. Because you're always thinking of the people, informing the people, educating the people on what's happening, uh, the facts. I mean, you're all about the facts. It's not even emotional for you. It's it, These are the facts. And if the facts are in front of you, this is what makes sense. So what you're doing isn't making sense. This makes sense. Well, and you know what? That's so true. <laughs> even if I like your idea, if it doesn't make sense, I will tell you why. And then maybe you have an idea how it can make more sense. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say you all were able to get the city to you know, put a halt to Robert Brown and spend less, stop putting out more money. Um, if you were Alderman, what would you have done with that extra money for the city? Oh, that's a, I probably have used it to a couple things because one, we have a huge fire police pension deficit. So if we, we could have started to pay that down with a portion of that. The second thing is uh, we, have all, we have all these great buildings that they have let deteriorate. I probably maintain my, my house and those are my buildings and those are what the public uses. I mean, we have capital improvements budgets and we say we're gonna do something but then we don't follow through with it. And so that's why I was a little upset when I heard on Monday that they're now talking about a skate park to the tune of a temporary one for 70,000 to a real one for five to 700,000. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. We just raised taxes, you know? So it's like, I feel like, I almost feel like we're in a 
place where they're not understanding that when you are trying to get back on from this fiscal track, you look at how you're spending your money. And you, you know, if we hadn't, if we could, if we had refinanced our bonds back when we did in 2018, we actually, it's like how people do with houses. We saved a whole lot of money because our interest rates dropped down, I think about 2%, right? If we hadn't had to go then put that back out for $4 million, we could have paid down the pension funds, we could have fixed up our buildings, we could have probably done more with our affordable housing. I mean, my, my idea of affordable housing is really working with having our existing landlords and buildings and work with them rather than keep going with these new buildings. But I mean, there's just so much we could have done. That's a good question, Malika, but I can tell you it wouldn't have, it would have been to manage that project much better and then hit pay down some of our debt. So say you're elected alderman tomorrow and the skate park is, is on the table for discussion. I just learned about the skate park from the Fifth Ward uh, forum that I gave last night. And um, yeah, I was really surprised with the, can the candidates seem supportive of it especially in the fifth ward when you know they're trying to get a school. There's so many other things they're trying to do with the fifth ward. And I'm just thinking, I know many others were thinking a skate park in the fifth ward. Is that what we really need right now? And the amount of money is going to be spent on it. So if you were alderman tomorrow and this skate park is up for a vote for discussion, what, what, would, what would you say? I don't even know how that came to be. See that, I don't know how it came to be. I don't know where this idea came from. Mm -hmm. And I don't, by the way, I don't disagree with it. I don't at the right time. I mean, I don't know if their plan is for five years from now or next year. I don't know how, who came up with the idea or what, but I know we have, and okay, but there's two other projects that people need to have on their radar. So there's also an RFP out for the dog shelter. Now there is a grant that comes with it for 2 million, but the project is 5 million minimum. And based on how we've managed our past projects, Fountain Square was supposed to be 5 million and it ended up being 7 million. So there's something that needs to come together. I think we need to have a, a uh, if I were on council right now, I'd say, guys, we need to set aside a Saturday and we need to figure out how many projects are out there, how much they cost and why. We still have the recycling center that I don't know what the heck's going on with that. We've got a proposal for an animal shelter and we don't know what's going on with that. And now this skate park and, you know, there used to be a skate park at Robert Crown and they had it for a couple of years. And I think they took it down about 20 years ago and because they said it was too dangerous. And I'm like, so, have we revisited as to why we didn't maintain that? I mean, I would personally also would like us to see James Park sledding hill may be made safe. I think it's one of the only things we have during the winter for these kids and adults and families. Why can't we just make that safe? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't understand. And I know there's been discussion on where, if they, going back to the skate park, where it should be. And if they're going to do a skate park, it seems to me that it should be very centrally located and it shouldn't be where someone is, uh oh, my grandson just got here. Um, and it should be someplace, you know, if it's a fifth ward or the second ward, it should, I don't think it should be up by Lovelace Park because who can get there? You know, and um, I'm on a Zoom call interview. Hi, honey. <laughs> Um, so they wanted, to, it just they, wanted proud, like, they wanted the kids to stop hanging out at Fountain Square to skate. So they want to create a skate park. That's that was my understanding last night. Okay. Well, I think we need to look more into it and find out. You know, what do other cities do? I'm I'm a big one at looking to see what other like Glencoe has a, a skate park behind their recreation center. Hmm. You now this is but this goes back to craziness. Why? <laughs> When they were designing Robert Crown, didn't they put in, figure out a pool? 
why didn't they figure out a skate park? Why didn't they figure out some of this stuff that would have appealed to more people? That's, that's, uh, that's just a source of irritation for me. I'm like, what were you guys thinking? <laughs> I love you, Mary. Um, to our guests, welcome, welcome. If you all have any questions, feel free to use the raise your hand signal. Uh, we will open up for questions for Mary Rosinski, or you can type your question in the chat and I'll call on you and you can unmute and uh, ask your question. So, so Mary, it's, I'm loving this discussion because I'm finding and talking to uh, many of the candidates, I'm telling them, you know, we need fighters right now. We need fighters up there. And some people don't like the, the word fighter. Like, why do we have to fight? Not fight each other, but really fight for what's right. And as we can see from our past administration, we needed some fighters. He, he wouldn't have gotten away with so much. Right. Had we had people up there fighting for the people. You know, um, and some, you know, and, and I, you know, sometimes I feel like uh, Democrats can, can be weak in that mm -hmm. sense, in that they rely so much on the process just working. And sometimes you, you're dealing with really evil people, absolutely. And so the process does not matter. So you need to come at them with another approach. Right. So, so what are your plans to deal with, you know, we don't have Trumpians in our council, thank God, but we do have a few aldermen up there who are not really about the people. We well, you know, that's that are, and some that aren't. <laughs> right. You know what? I think one of the things that I've noticed is we have a lot of good people. I mean, that's not, I think all, I, I think every one of the people is very decent. Um, but I, what I do think, okay, I've been in real estate for 40 years and I've dealt with all sorts of situations with families and business and contentious situations and not. So you, you know, through that, you need to learn to negotiate. And even though you're feeling something very deep and passionately inside, you still need to be able to have that discussion and put it out on the table safely. I think with our console, what I'm seeing is that I'm not seeing the questions asked and one of the things it's what you're not asking is more important than what you are asking sometimes. So I think that, you know, if what I've heard in the console sometimes is that people raise their voice a little bit and they call, get called angry or hostile. And I'm like, you know, I think we need to stop that nonsense. I mean, people who are passionate are going to show more emotion in their voice. And what is civility? I mean, sometimes when you have a hot topic, things aren't going to be as civil. You just have to kind of breathe it up. And as long as it doesn't get personally hateful, but we need to listen. I've often thought that in Evanston, we're the city of signs. And if it's always a joke around town. It's like you could go to, you know, when you got to Evanston because there's signs all over the place about something. But I've seen the increase in the number of signs over the last four or five years, six years, because of the fact, and I, I attribute it to the fact that people don't feel like they're being heard. You know, they're hearing, they're talking, and then they realize that the ears are shut at console. So they're putting up signs to show other people around them how they feel. I mean, that's why I put up signs. I put up signs because I want my neighbors to know that something's not right, at least not in my opinion. I mean, not that I'm the all soul, but if something is like not, if it's not good for the community, and there's a lot of people like when they were going to shut down Chandler Center a number of years ago, I was not in that battle, but I certainly supported everybody that was because that was important to the community. And I keep going back to, I think what we need on, on the city council is a real estate perspective, a perspective that brings in from the entire North shore, places that are doing it well and places that are not doing it well. So to your point, I think it, you know, you just don't say, okay, I, I, I get disappointed that there's not more discussion at council mm. in, on huge issues. Yeah. It's amazing to me. Um, we got a question in, Mary. How would you keep families in Evanston affordable housing? 
In affordable housing, I think one thing we need to do is we need to find out where our, our naturally occurring affordable housing is happening, right? So we need to figure out what is the cost to live in Evanston on your wealth gap. And one thing we've never talked about in Evanston, and I believe me, I've asked it on council, I've asked it at the affordable housing committee and stuff like that. We have an incredible wealth gap in this town. We have uh, AMI, uh, median income for white people, that's about 79,000, for the average about 70,000, and for non-white, 49,000. So when we say we're gonna meet the AMI, who are we meeting it for? That's one thing on an equity issue. The second thing I think we have to, we, in order to keeping people here, we need to control our budget, keep the taxes down. And then I think that for people who are homeowners that have decent jobs, like if you're making enough 50,000, 60,000, you may need some help with a, a down payment or you may need some help with your interest rate. But I think we should be able to help people who can buy properties at the levels get in there and help them be able to afford it, but then have that paid back to the city. We do forgivable stuff, but then it doesn't become self-sustaining. Does that answer your question? Uh, Mr. O'Rourke, does this answer your question? He said yes. I don't know if that was confusing because it's sort of, multi we have an affordable housing program, but it's not real clear how we do it. We have the inclusionary housing, which relies on the developers to build in like these micro units, but it doesn't help with the families. So I was saying, I myself live in a two flat and if a three bedroom, what does it cost to live in a three bedroom? Right? So I would say if affordable housing if for three bedroom is, 1800 or 1500 then maybe you take people like me or throughout the hall of evanston and you help those landlords subsidize the people who would be meeting the affordable housing does that make sense yes it makes sense uh mr you know we're, we're going to come back to you because i think he's typing some more there um simone from maya papaya and Tony Macaroni, I walk by the <laughs> store all the time. Uh, they have a question for you. Uh, sorry, uh, I don't have video in this computer. I don't mean to be rude, but it's an old computer here in my store. It doesn't have video. Uh, I, I, first of all, I just want to say that I'm here as an individual, and you know, I'm not I'm not representing the uh, Central Street uh, uh, Association or anything. I'm, I'm a resident of the Seven Ward, and I'm business owner, uh, and and. Uh, you know, I've also been kind of, uh, you know, uh, unpleased with, with, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, uh, you know, or shocked with some of the things going on, 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 you know, the city council and all that, you know, I don't, I don't follow too closely, but you know, the, the, what I see, I, I'm not sure I like, um, However, we, we, I have been both as an individual and as a business per owner person um, pleased with the uh, central, uh, with the Evanston, uh, City of Evanston Economic Development Team. They have been extremely helpful to Central Street. They help us uh, get started with SSA, uh, which has been, you know, now has, it's about a year old now and it has been, you know, fundamental in bringing traffic and revitalizing the district. Uh, but there are some issues that still stand. And number one uh, on everybody's mind here is parking. You know, uh, there's little parking and parking is uh, often punitive. Um, the city has been uh, relaxing, you know, has been a little bit more flexible during the holidays, during COVID and all that. Like uh, but this is a problem that needs a, you know, a, 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 a longer term situation, a longer term solution. You know, we, you know, you know, a lot of people shop in Wilmette because it's just easier and cheaper to park. It's, it's not the cost, it's the thought, it's the, it's the symbolism of, 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 uh, of that parking fee. Um, and the other issue is Northwestern, right? Uh, the gains are, um, you know, uh, and again, I'm speaking for myself, restaurants uh, profit a lot from gains, but retail, uh, you know, the, 
the parking is hogged by game goers, the streets get, uh, you know, invaded. So uh, those are the, you know, if you ask us, this is, this is what are on our mind. And, you know, we're wondering, wh what can we do for us? You know, how can you help us with those issues? Uh, actually, Simone, that, those are great questions because we talked about both of those at um, when we were, you know, talking about the Northwestern. And with the Northwestern t coming back and forth, there's other than trying to manage the events, there's not a whole lot you, we can do about that, I don't think, um, other than what they did do with the city parking lot over there and limit the time to the two hours. I think Northwestern can work more with their parking strategy and where they give free parking and make sure everyone knows it so that they don't totally ruin the business shopping time for Central Street. Um, I agree with you 100% on the parking. I think we are do a disservice to all of our residents and businesses in Evanston with our parking fees. Uh, I think it makes it not very inviting and I think we have a poor reputation for coming, spending money and then getting a $25, $30 ticket. And I've heard this from many, many people throughout. I don't think we should have the parking on Central Street fees. I don't think they should be downtown. But right now, I think we need to get people back to Evanston shopping at our local stores. The issue we do have to deal with is, will people park, do you do a two hour limit or three hour limit so that the people who are working in the stores don't park on the street? You know, that is another issue because in other communities that has been an issue um, so that your street parking is available for shoppers to come in and visit. Um, that's, that's important. But I feel like we can figure out parking spaces for the businesses and then try to keep our street parking for the residents. But I think that has to be a discussion with that, you know, open up and have more of that discussion and hear what the residents or the business owners say. That's, that's, that was a good, that was a great question. And yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, because I used to get my hair done up here at Candy's on Central Street. And um, she was always wanting, you know, more parking for her um, clients coming in. Fortunately, I was able to just walk up there. I yeah. love living in the seventh ward. Just walk everywhere. Walk you do. It's it's great. I mean, the seventh ward is funny because Mary Gavin asked you a question like, "What do you t take me for a trip along your ward?" You know, sort of, "What are your assets?" And it's like we have so much. I mean, we're available, and you want all of Evanston to be able to use it. But between the lakefront and Northwestern Hospital and the golf course and Northwestern, and then the business district, it's just sort of like this wonderful, like mile, two mile stretch of parks and houses and business districts. Yes, yes. And um, I don't know if Mr. O'Rourke, if you want to unmute, I know he uh, had some more <clears throat> to say about the affordable housing. One of the things is affordable housing is not only just for the individual. I was a landlord <clears throat> with six units in Evanston. My taxes were going through the roof and mine were only two bedroom units and uh, I'd like to see more three bedroom units so families could rent at a fair price without the taxes going through the roof. My taxes on a $600,000 building were almost 20,000. Yeah, see, and I happen to agree, in all fairness, I want you to know that this is my brother. He lives out in Los Angeles and he has done a lot with housing and creative ideas. And so, I mean, we haven't talked about this, but I remember, and that's been a real project, you know, in Evanston, landlords are, people think of landlords as a big bad guy, but they don't realize, like I know I was talking to a couple of the older, but every day before I walk out my door, I have to send the tax collector about $1,300 a month, you know, so it's hard to give affordable housing when our taxes are so high. So I don't know, I, you can answer me, is there... I'm looking at, is there tax credits we can give to our existing landlords so that they don't lose money? Because I think most of the landlords that I know that are businesses like you with your six unit and they're, they weren't charging exorbitant rents, but it's like you have to charge a minimum just to cover your overhead. 
And this goes for our Central Street business districts too. I mean, people don't realize that the, the rent for the commercial is so expensive because of the fact that, as you said, Tom, that the, the taxes are very high in Evanston. And that's why I keep going, let's, if we can continue to you know, spend wisely, manage our budget with a vision of a long-term plan, which we don't seem to have had in the last couple of years. We're like, if we need to plan on where we wanna be. Like, how do we get other tax money revenue into this city so that our residents can be here so that we can have other places and subsidize affordable housing? Like you said, like you could have rented for less if your um, taxes weren't quite so high. If you were working with the city and they said you could, you will reduce your rent here, but you have to charge this amount. You get a tax credit of some sort, but you have to charge this amount and stay affordable and make it ongoing. I mean, could that have been something that worked with you? Yes. It was just the taxes were so high and what the city told me the taxes were gonna be, they never reduced it to what they told me it was gonna be. So mm -hmm. I'd have to rent three of the six units just to pay the taxes uh, on the building. Right. So it just didn't make any sense. You know what they did, and Malika, you may know this, or maybe Simone, is on Hewn Bakery, right over here on Central Street, a commercial. I think the city did something which I thought was great, because I like Paul Zolmanak over at the Economic Development. I think he's a creative. He lives here in Evanston. He cares about Evanston. Um, and I know he has some good ideas. And I think that what they did was they, they I think they forgave the city part of, or part of the city tax, on that building so that they could get their first five years at a lesser rate, which, you know, I'd much rather have them have pay, be paying less taxes and have a build, have a store in there that is generating other sales tax revenue because when a building is empty in a business district, well, after a period of time, that landowner can get vacant building status. So then their whole tax bill goes down so we end up losing. So sometimes what can appear to be a loss in the immediate ends up being a big win down the road. So I think those are all really important issues to look at, but I think the affordable housing issue here in Evanston is really critical. And I, I feel like we need to figure out how it works for landlords and homeowners. You know, at one point, I mean, if we had a really good, division of property maintenance, I would suggest that we actually purchase some of the buildings that are in other wards and turn them into affordable housing. Um, and then if you did it, you'd have the money coming in from the rent, you'd put down maybe 200,000 on a three or four unit building, and then you would be sustainable with it. But we have to get our property management section of our city in order. We're not capable right now of the city of doing that. Hence, we have so much deferred maintenance on every one of our buildings. So I think that's another thing that needs to be happening simultaneously right now. Because if you don't fix something now, it doesn't get better, it only gets worse. Thank you so much, Mary. We've gone over, but I always enjoy talking to you. So we've gone over and I want to respect your time. I know you have an extremely busy schedule going on, especially right now with the campaigning. But um, thank you so much, Mary. I mean, I thank you for just being who you are prior to you running for Alderman for the Seventh Ward. Just being that person in our community who's always trying to inform us of what's happening. You lay out the facts for us to process it and even do our own research. You tell us where to go, where to find <laughs> it, way of this, you know, to, to back up everything that, that you're saying. So I thank you for being that person in our community. Thank you. So thank you for your work. To inform us. Your, your site has just enlightened so many people into all, areas of our community and what's going on there. So that's been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who came. And please, if you have any questions for me personally, my email's here, my website's here. I really want to hear from you. Yes. And let the public know, because I'm going to release this video out to the public, 
I so will. let them know where to contact you. And I'll also put it in the description on social media, but let them know. Okay. All right. Thank no, you now. so much. Mary, let them know oh. now. <laughs> <laughs> let, let them know now. Just say it. Just tell the people. Email is Rosinski info, Rosinski2021 at Gmail. That's my email. I'll write it in here. And my website is Rosinski2021.org. Yes. So everyone, please get your questions answered, engage, get to know Mary Rosinski. Um, if your questions weren't answered today, please reach out to her. Again, I will put uh, her information in the description um, in the post. And um, I look forward to talking to you again, Mary, as the election, I mean, the election got heated up pretty quickly. Oh, I know, didn't it? Oh my God, it's, it's exciting. And I love to see so much discourse, it's great. <laughs> you know, we're talking about those issues that people didn't realize that were out there. So that's what we need. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the transparency we need to talk about what's actually real, what's actually happening. But thank you so much, Mary. And you all, please be sure to stay tuned here at Evanston Live TV. We have more candidates coming up, more forums. Our next forum is the mayoral debate on February 2nd at 6 p.m. Oh, that'll be good. Yes, yes. Please be sure to tune in for that and um, stay engaged. Stay thank engaged. <laughs> all right, bye everyone. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Bye.